This is a mystery which has existed for over a century and was first discovered by the famed geologist John Wesley Powell in 1869. Geologists believe that layers of rock are deposited on top of each other little by little over time. This means that when we examine layers in exposed rock faces, you should generally be able to see that each successive layer is older than the other layer with no gaps between them. The thing about the great unconformity is that about a billion years of rock appears to be missing between the 3 billion year old sediment and the relatively young 550 million year layer sitting directly on top of this. To add to the mystery, this 550 million year layer is just a few million years before the Cambrian explosion which marked the widespread appearance of complex life on Earth. Let's dive in and find out more. It is believed that unconformities tend to reflect long-term changes in the pattern of accumulation of sedimentary or igneous strata in low-lying areas. These are then thought to be uplifted and eroded, then subsequently subsiding and eventually being buried under younger sediment. The first person to discover one of these was James Hutton in 1787 in Sikar Point in Scotland. It is an angular unconformity that consists of gently dipping reddish, upper Devonian and lower Carboniferous breccias, sandstone and conglomerates of the old red sandstone, overlying deeply eroded, nearly vertical, greyish Silurian shales. The Silurian shales are thought to be deposited by turbidity currents in deep sea environments 425 million years ago. The overlying Devonian strata were deposited by rivers and streams about 345 million years ago. This was therefore a gap of 80 million years. Hutton was the first to demonstrate that there were significant breaks in the geological record. This, together with other unconformities, provided evidence for Hutton's idea about the recycling of geological materials and for unconformities representing very large timescales. He argued that these concepts pointed to a great antiquity of the Earth and the vastness of the geological timescale. Nearly a hundred years later, John Powell would discover an unconformity of such a magnitude that to this day it still cannot be fully explained. While studying the rocks in the Grand Canyon, he came across a break in the geological record between what is called the Tonto Group, which sits on the underlying rocks of the Grand Canyon Supergroup and the Vishnu basement rocks. This unconformity represents a period as much as 1.2 to 1.6 billion years. Although the great unconformity can be easily spotted in the Grand Canyon, similar breaks are apparent in lots of other places. Charles Walcott stated the following about it in 1910. I do not know of a case of proven conformity between Cambrian and pre-Cambrian rocks on the North American continent. In all localities where the contact is sufficiently extensive or where fossils have been found in the basal Cambrian beds or above the basal conglomerate and coarser sandstones, an unconformity has been found to exist. Stated in another way, the pre-Cambrian land surface was formed of sedimentary, eruptive and crystalline rocks that did not in any known instant immediately proceed in deposit or origin the Cambrian sediments. Everywhere there is a stratigraphic and time break between the known Precambrian rocks and Cambrian sediments of the North American continent. Some geologists have hypothesized that whatever caused them was some kind of global event. One possibility is that glaciation might have caused large parts of the surface to be eroded at roughly the same time. The only way this could happen is if Earth was entirely covered in ice, like a snowball Earth scenario. A new study suggests that there may not have been one unconformity worldwide, but rather a series of them roughly coincident around the world and that they believe that this may have been caused by an ancient supercontinent called Rodinia that formed about one billion years ago. The new research is based on a dating technique called thermochronology. Thermochronology is the science and practice of inferring thermal histories of minerals and rocks from chemical, isotopic and physical properties of minerals 
that are sensitive to both temperature and time. It examines how temperature would affect the decay rate of certain elements and uses this to attempt to understand what might have happened to the rock over its lifetime. So what did they discover? They believed that the lower layer had been thrust upward to the surface about 700 million years ago. They think that it was then subjected to erosion that scoured away its upper layers of rock. What could erode so many layers of rock? They believe that the supercontinent, Rodinia, is responsible. This predates Pangaea and is thought to have formed in the process called extrovert assembly. Here pieces of a prior supercontinent that has broken apart and meet again after having travelled all the way round the planet. They think that during this journey the edges of the pieces experience significant erosions before smashing back together. Where the continents collide they think that the mountain belts form and that these will be responsible for large amounts of erosion. Both the birth and death of Rodinia may have wrecked havoc all over the world as its pieces came together and then eventually broke apart. There is currently no widely accepted explanation for the great unconformity amongst geoscientists. So what can we make of this? The first thing that we need to consider is that of the dating of the rocks and strata. The current assumption is that this is a slow process which takes a long time, and it is based on the following principles. The principle of superposition. This means that each layer above a layer must be younger and any layer lower than it must be older. The principle of continuity, and this states that the strata owe their existence to sediments in a fluid. At the time when a stratum formed, it was either circumscribed by another landmass or ran around the entire globe. The principle of horizontality, at the time when a stratum formed, it would be parallel to the lower surface onto which it was being deposited and its upper surface would be parallel to the horizon. And lastly, the idea that two strata with the same fossil content are the same age. I have previously looked at the work of Guy Berthold, who was a French sedimentologist who wants to understand the mechanics of how this might work. He conducted many experiments that showed that the view that sedimentation occurs slowly and horizontally was wrong. His experiment showed that deposits are formed parallel to the subsurface layer, not the horizon, and that this process can occur very rapidly. Now this cast doubt on the accepted formation process and dating of layers of rock, but geologists also have radiometric dating of the rocks in these layers that surely confirms the slower process. Here we must also be careful as there are problems with this type of measurement, as it assumes a fixed decay rate for an isotope that remains constant and it also makes the assumption on the abundance of elements in the initial rock. I have previously discussed some of the more recent findings that have shown that the decay rate of certain unstable elements can be altered through low energy nuclear reactions, through either exposure to hydrogen isotope plasma and also through the work of Vladimir Vysotsky who showed that certain bacteria were capable of converting cesium-137 which has a half-life of 30 years, into barium-138, which has a half-life of only 310 days. In the first case, we need only consider the idea that increased electrical discharge through the rocks could therefore change this decay rate, making it appear like the rocks were older than they are. The second example also makes me consider Eugene Bagashoff's idea of an ultra-deep biosphere and what role these bacteria might play in altering the chemical composition of the rocks surrounding them, and hence the decay rate. In the latter case, this would be unlikely to alter the composition and consistency across an entire strata, and would be more likely to create pockets. In the electrical discharge case, I have previously discussed how this might explain why metals are found in veins which terminate with heavier elements like uranium. This too will lead to veins with altered chemistry unless the discharge events were on a planet-wide scale. Could a layer laid down in these circumstances lead to what appears as a much older layer with a large gap between this and the next layer laid down after this event when it had calmed down? One interesting point to note is that the layer that sits above this 
is the start of the formation of complex life on the planet, known as the Cambrian Explosion. One aspect that is also worth further investigation is what evidence we have for how the landmass has looked in the past. This idea of the repeated formation of supercontinents, which collide and then break apart and then collide again. What evidence is used to determine that this actually happened, what their shape was and what their direction is. I have recently read Hapgood's pole shift book and I think there are certain aspects of this that are worth exploring in more detail. There are a number of different models to explain the formation of the continents of which Hapgood's is just one. Previously I have looked at an expanding earth model to explain the continents and their movement as well as potentially that of a shifting pole. Hapgood's model is worth exploring in more detail as it reveals elements that must be considered both in terms of ice ages but also processes like mountain building. I would like to therefore compare different models to understand where the shortfalls for each lie and what common ground can be found in terms of ice ages but also the formation process. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.